Welcome to the southern part of Braunton Burrows and to a tour produced by the Explore Braunton project. We're about to bring the history of Braunton Burrows to life and hope that you enjoy this unique experience. On your screen now is a map showing you the route we'll be taking. We will begin by visiting some relics of the training that took place here during World War II. We will then retrace our steps and cross the southernmost tip of Braunton Burrows. When we reach the sea, we will turn left and follow the beach around the tip of the peninsula, making a circular route back to the starting point. It's important to keep dogs under close control at all times here because military activity is frequent. Care must also be taken to avoid disturbing the wildlife that lives here. Before we set off to our first interactive zone, a brief word about Braunton Marshes, which you will have more than likely crossed using the toll road. The marshes were once salt marsh which flooded at each high tide. The villagers used to keep their animals here, but the quality of the grazing was poor, and because of the tides, the area was fraught with danger. In 1811, a grand scheme to drain the salt marsh was put in place, and by 1857, two stages of reclamation had been completed. The land soon supported lush grass on which the farm animals grew fatter than ever before. To find the first interactive zone, we will need to stand with our backs to the White House and leave the car park via a track ahead which can be found between some large stone boulders and next to an information sign. The estuary needs to be kept on our left hand side. Follow the track straight ahead, passing through a disused car parking area beyond the boulders. We will soon reach a clearing where another track cuts right across ours. You will see a map on the screen to guide you in a moment. When you're ready, let's go. You've made it into the first zone, at the point where a new track cuts across ours. This area used to be a large car park, but has subsequently been reduced in size. The restriction has proved vital to preserve and encourage a very rare plant known as petalwort, which thrives here. Looking ahead, we can see the start of a wooden boardwalk, which leads over the dunes. We will follow that later, but for now, we need to turn right. The track that we are going to follow has been used for centuries by villagers from Braunton and Saunton, who wished to use the ferry, which connected Crow Point to the other side of the estuary. The ferry is long gone, but the ancient right-of-way remains. More recently, during World War II, American troops were stationed in Braunton. They were here to train for the D-Day landings in Normandy, and we will hear more about this soon. The ferry path was widened by the army in order to accommodate tanks, and in places you can still see the metal remains of a temporary road surface that was constructed to aid access. The track became known locally as the American Road, and the name has stuck ever since. Let's turn right and follow the American Road. We will need to keep to the track as it goes through a five-barred gate, eventually passing grazing land to the right and a grassy sand dune landscape to our left. We must bypass any footpath signs we see and walk for around 10 minutes until we find a track leading to the left with another five-barred gate which might be open or closed. It will take about 10 minutes to walk there. When we're ready, off we go. Well done, you've found the next interactive zone. We will soon leave the American road and proceed along the track to our left which leads towards the dunes. At this point we are going to think about what was going on in Britain in 1944. At this time war was raging in Europe against Nazi Germany. 
Although Russia was making progress towards Berlin in the east, it was agreed that a second front was needed in order to defeat Germans who were occupying much of Western Europe. Thousands of American, Canadian and British troops joined forces in southern England to prepare for Operation Overlord. D-Day was planned for more than a year before it happened, and those who were to take part needed several months of training. In 1943, Lieutenant Colonel Paul W. Thompson had been tasked with finding training ground for his American soldiers, but all the best ground had been claimed already. He had no choice but to accept the Atlantic coast near Bronton. As it turned out, the beaches here were ideal for amphibious exercises, despite the fierce Atlantic surf. The nearby sands were soon found to be identical to the targeted beaches in every respect, including the type of sand, beach gradient, and tidal range. Anyone who has seen Omaha Beach will instantly recognize an uncanny resemblance to Wollacombe and Saunton. Every acre was needed for exercises and rehearsals using live ammunition, explosives, tanks, artillery, and air support, all of which became features of the assault training center here at Bronton. Colonel Thompson was originally given the task of teaching the troops how to neutralise the enemy beach defences and then fight their way inland, although the second part of his mission was later relocated to Slapton Beach in South Devon. Local people were generally pleased to host their American counterparts and were intrigued by their sudden presence in the hitherto sleepy village. For six months, Braunton resounded with speeding army vehicles, lumbering construction machinery and the almost non-stop distant sound of explosions. The village pubs overflowed with boisterous young men in American uniforms and the transatlantic twang could be heard in all the shops. We're going to walk ahead now. As we proceed, look for some concrete structures to the left of the track. Continue along the path until you reach the last one you can see, and you'll find the next interactive zone. Hi, so do you have any idea why these concrete structures are here and what their purpose might be? On D-Day, the military planned to invade the beaches using landing craft. When the craft reached shallow water, the ramp at the front of the boat would be lowered and the troops would pour out on foot or in vehicles. They needed to practice this drill over and over again, and so these concrete replica landing craft were built here. During practice, the structures would have corrugated tin added to the square platforms at the back in order to emulate the shape of the boats. The troops would have practiced loading the craft and then unloading swiftly when the signal was given. One of the structures has an interesting feature at the back of it, where one of the engineers used his finger to write his regiment and platoon number in the concrete while it was still wet. Within months, and as quickly as the Americans had arrived, they had left to travel to Normandy. An eerie silence settled in Braunton. The ambitious air and sea assault planned for D-Day was dependent on a combination of factors, including the weather, tidal conditions and most important of all, the element of surprise. Poor weather delayed D-Day for 24 hours, but on the 6th of June, 1944, Supreme Allied Commander General Dwight Eisenhower gave the command. A total of 156,000 men took part in D-Day at five carefully selected beaches along the Normandy coast. The surprise element helped British and Canadian troops at beaches codenamed Gold, Juno and Sword. American troops at Utah also managed to land without major casualties. Those at nearby Omaha Beach, however, suffered severe losses as they encountered terrible weather and a crack division of German troops. 
at the spearhead of these bloody landings were the American friends of North Devon. On D-Day alone, up to 3,000 Allied troops died. Some 9,000 were wounded or declared missing. The horrific reality of war must have been a very far cry from the peaceful countryside where the troops had practised. The furthest landing craft here has a memorial on it and a wreath laying ceremony is held here every year on the 6th of June to commemorate all those who lost their lives in battle. We must retrace our steps now, back to the beginning of the boardwalk that we saw earlier. On the way back, look out for rabbits, which have played an important part in maintaining the short grass you see, and in turn encouraging the special plants and flowers that thrive here. When we reach the boardwalk, we will need to proceed along it to find our next interactive zone. Well done, you found the start of the boardwalk again. Proceed along it now, I'll catch up with you again further along. You've made it to the next zone and are now in the midst of a very special world-class landscape, that of Braunton Burrows. The burrows are owned and managed by the Christie Devon Estates and lie at the centre of the North Devon Biosphere Reserve. Biosphere Reserves are designated by the United Nations for testing out sustainable development on a regional scale. North Devon's Biosphere Reserve is the UK's first and Braunton Burrows, where we are now, lies at the heart of it. It is one of a network of biosphere reserves throughout the world that includes such important areas as the Danube Delta, the Hawaiian Islands and the Great Gobi. The burrows are internationally famous for their plant and animal life, which has been fascinating scientists and naturalists since the 17th century. Nearly 500 species of wildflower have been recorded here, which helps to make Braunton the most biodiverse parish in England. The flowers that grow here in the spring and summer are widely varied and some are nationally rare. Flowers that you might typically spot here include evening primrose, a tall plant that flowers in late summer. The fragrant bright yellow flowers are pollinated by night-flying moths. Another plant that you might see here is Viper's Bugloss. The tall spikes of spectacular blue flowers appear during mid and late summer. The flowers resemble a snake's head, and years ago people believed that the plant would cure a viper's bite. The plants here are special because the habitat is so special. The lime-rich soil of the dry dunes and the wet areas or slacks in between combine to make it an ideal nursery for a fantastic array of species. We've asked some local school children to come along so that they can tell us more about the dunes and the different types of habitat that can be found within them. The strand line will contain a limited number of pioneer species. There will only be a few, like sea rocket and prickly wart, because these are two of the very few plants that can withstand the conditions. At the strand line, the conditions are very harsh. It's dry and salty and often very unstable, so it's constantly changing. It also lacks nutrients. At the fore dune, embryo dunes have grown up which has allowed the dune surface to be raised away from the more harsh conditions. 
Rainwater here makes the dune less salty, so marangrass, a xerosphytic plant, can colonise. Dune ridges are also dominated by marum grass. Marum here is the most dominant species across the salmosphere. The marum traps sand and then grows up to stop itself from suffocating. This is why marum grass has such long roots, because it just grows up and up. On the dune ridges, the conditions are very windy and dry. There are high rates of evapotranspiration. Marum, amongst many other species on the dunes, is specially adapted to the dry conditions because they curl their leaves up and around to reduce water loss by having less surface area exposed to the wind. Species diversity continues to increase, including flowering plants, mosses and lichens. The dune slacks are often damp areas where there are pools or ponds of water. They are nutrient-rich areas because they leach from surrounding dunes. Therefore, there is wide species diversity, including species like rushes, calcicoles, orchids and mosses. The height of the water table makes a lot of difference here, and the amount of water dictates how many and what type of species colonise. The climate is damp but relatively sheltered by surrounding dunes. The dune scrub contains bushes and trees. It is toward the very end of the succession, far from the dunes and slacks. Thanks everyone, that was fascinating. You might already have glimpsed a rabbit, but there are many other animals that inhabit the burrows, many of which are more difficult to spot. They include lizards, newts, frogs and toads, not to mention the 33 species of butterfly that have been recorded here. Let's continue now along the boardwalk. Keep straight ahead as the dunes rise and fall beneath your feet and you will eventually emerge onto the beach, where you will find the next interactive zone. Hello! After so many dunes, it can be quite satisfying to reach the sea. In an area to the right of where we stand now, behind the first sand dunes, a lighthouse once stood. Throughout history, the fate of people who sailed into this bay was a grim one, as Biddeford Bar, a sandbank that lies across the mouth of the estuary, is notoriously difficult to navigate. It caused countless wrecks, and in order to lessen the wrecks, a lighthouse was built here in the mid-1800s. It had a tall, octagonal tower, and the light from it was visible from up to 14 miles away. The lighthouse was manned by two keepers, who lived in the square living quarters at the base of the tower. They took it in turns to work four- or eight-hour shifts, which meant that neither keeper could travel far from the lighthouse, as it would soon be his turn again, and in any case, they would need to sleep and eat between shifts, leaving little opportunity for much else. Their provisions and fresh water were sent over the estuary from Appledore, as that was easier than transporting them from Braunton. It must have been a lonely existence out here at the best of times, and thoroughly inhospitable in bad weather. The keepers were withdrawn from the lighthouse in 1945, when the tower and dwellings became unstable, and the whole thing was demolished in 1957. A modern navigational light is now situated at the tip of Crow Point, where we are headed next. It is operated remotely by Trinity House, an authority that controls all navigational aids in British territorial waters. From here, you might be lucky enough to see the military as they practice crossing the estuary with their amphibious vehicles, which are known as ducks. The gently sloping beach is an ideal training ground where Royal Marines can practice landing from ships lying just offshore or from a camp at Instow on the opposite side of the estuary. 
When they reach shallow water, they drive out of the water, up the beach and into the burrows. The military have been carrying out such practice since World War II, and the footage on your screen now shows both archive and recent film shot right here. This landscape is ideal as it allows soldiers to assault the beach, take cover in the sand dunes, mount attack and defence, practice driving in sandy conditions and be largely unseen by the public. Public access actually helps military training because some battlefields contain civilians. On the whole, the military avoid civilians in case they are enemy scouts and soldiers are trained not to discharge their weapons or let off thunder flashes when civilians are nearby. Soldiers use pyrotechnics to simulate warfare and they carry their firearms, but live firing hasn't occurred here for at least 10 years. The plentiful sand means that soldiers must practice cleaning their rifles. Imagine sand sticking to the oil and jamming the works. They have to learn to deal with this before they meet the same situation in a real conflict. You see the you see the tree just in front of the tree line here. Yeah, seeing yeah. Right, as soon as we get to there. Great! Bang! Hey! Face the sea now and turn left keeping the sand dunes to your left and the sea to your right. We're going to walk in this direction for another 10 minutes. Remember to keep close to the dunes and that the tide can come in very quickly. <laughs> Greetings! Have you found many interesting shells or creatures on the beach today? Hundreds of oyster catchers can be seen feeding here, alongside smaller numbers of curlew, ringed plover, dunlin, godwit, sanderling and turnstone, particularly at low tide and during the winter months. It is very important that you try not to disturb any birds here at Crow Point. At high tide it is one of the few places on the estuary where they can rest, and even at low tide please take care and keep dogs under close control. The beach we are walking along is known as Crow Beach, but it turns into Saunton Sands as it stretches for four miles behind us, all the way to Saunton in the north. It is a great beach for finding shells, as the children here can tell you. See if you can find these shells for yourself. These are cockle shells. Cockles are bivalves, which means they have two symmetrical halves to their shells. They are found in many estuaries and sandy bays around the British coast. They burrow to a depth of 5 centimetres and feed by filtering plankton from the seawater. Lots of people like eating cockles, which are cooked and then seasoned with vinegar and pepper. This is a razor shell. It looks like an old-fashioned cutthroat razor. The long animal that lives inside also burrows into the sand, but can do so very quickly, digging faster than a man. They also feed by filtering organic matter from the water, but they do so via two tubes, which they extend up through the sand to the water above. The holes created by the siphons can sometimes be seen in the sand. Among the other shells here are those that belong to predators. One example is the necklace shell, which gets its name from a ring of eggs that surround the collar in spring and early summer. The creature inside feeds by drilling a hole into the shells of bivalves, such as cockles, razor shells and barnacles, and then sucking out the meat. Ugh! 
The shells we find here are not necessarily from animals that live on this part of the beach. Barnacles, for instance, live on rocks closer to the water. They are often moved by the action of the tide, which also washes the sand along the beach. It is this movement that actually built Crow Point, as you can see from the pictures on your screen now. As the sand accumulated, a ridge formed and was stabilised by plants like marram grass. It was, however, constantly eroded by high tides and human pressures. In 1984 there was a storm and Crow Neck, as it is called, was breached. It has since been naturally rebuilt, but this cycle of destruction and repair continues and there is every chance that Crow Point will one day become an island again. Let's keep going now, all the way to the end of the beach, where it starts to curve around to the left. The next interactive zone is located near the modern navigational light, which we heard about earlier. See you there! Whew, it's hard work on this sand, isn't it? Here we are then, near the modern light, which helps sailors to navigate Biddeford Bar, the treacherous sandbank. You might be able to make out the two lighthouses on the opposite bank of the estuary. Sailors line up their vessel with the two lights in order to find safe passage through the estuary to Appledore or Biddeford. It's very hard to imagine now, but this estuary used to be alive with boats going to and fro. Many boats traded from the now disused port at Velator and took produce from Braunton's farms to markets around the country. They returned with a variety of imports, including coal from Wales. Some fishermen travelled as far as Newfoundland to fish, and Braunton mariners were widely reputed to be the best in the country, if not the world. Many seafaring fortunes were made in Braunton, and most of the large houses in the village and nearby town of Barnstable were built by highly successful ship owners. At low spring tides, barges used to be seen here, loading gravel from the bed of the estuary. It was used in the building industry, most notably for the extension of the former civil airfield at Chivna, when it was taken over by the RAF in 1940. Shipping declined greatly in the mid-1900s, although the gravel trade was one of the last businesses to surrender to modern road transport. A news reporter visited Crow Point in the 1960s to report on the end of this era. He had a go at loading and unloading the gravel barges, which was a very tough job. This is how he got on. This is not a normal vessel. She's one of the famous gravel barges now working out of Barnstable on the gravel banks in the Tor Torridge estuary. Originally, these barges were of course all sailing barges and they came out of Appledore, Biddeford, Fremington and Barnstable. At high tide, they would beach themselves up on the gravel banks at Braunston. Well, today, of course, they've got diesel engines, but they still need high tide both for beaching and to lift themselves off again. Oh, I've had enough of this. Pat, let's stop shoveling for a minute and have a little talk, shall we? I need a rest. Hello, Clive. I'm not as fit as you, obviously. <laughs> How long have you been working on the barges? Oh, about 12 years. About 12 years I've been. I started uh, when I was 15 and then two years out the army, in the army, and then I, I started barging again then. But it's a job now, really, that's... Uh, well, it's getting played out. Because the gravel in here, you know, like it used to be, you see, you come down, you can't get the right kind of gravel, and then they can't sell it up the, up the yard. So you end up, you know, you're not doing half the work like. Hey, Oh, lovely. Been waiting for this, I I should think I have to, thank you. Yeah, I can't get used to this idea of calling you a fairy. Why do they call you a fairy? Oh, I've always had the name since I was a kid. 
It's a family heirloom, I suppose. All the family's fair, see? You've all got this very fair here? Yeah. My Take brothers it. and sisters, my father originally got called it, like when he come to town first. Well, it takes me a bit of courage to actually call you it. Actually, how long have you worked on these barges, really? Oh, about ten years. Do you like them? Do you like the life? Oh, yeah, it's a good old life, really. You've got to be... You gotta be interested in it, like you know. The one thing I've noticed, Pat's always on the wheel and you're always down there doing the cooking. Oh well, well I don't like steering, see? Why? I like my tea, but I don't like steering. You can you can if you have to. Oh yeah, I'll do a trick. I'm supposed to do a trick from Fremont to Crow. See, that's my half. And his half is from Fremont to Barnstable, see? Well I steer when I got to, like, you know, I don't like it very much. We'll continue now around the point. By the way, have you wondered how Crow Point got its name? We can't be sure, but according to local hearsay, it came from the similarity with the lookout or crow's nest on a ship. This was an important lookout point for many years. Keep to the foot of the dunes as you round the point and don't stray too far towards the mud if the tide is out. Not only is it a popular resting place for birds, but it can get very slippery too. Look for a large wooden boat lying on its side on the beach. That's where our next interactive zone is. Good, you've reached the boat. We don't know much about the history of this vessel other than it was a fishing boat. It must, however, be the most photographed wreckage in the West Country. Fishing was an important trade for Braunton men, and here in the Tor Torridge estuary, salmon fishing was once a feature of everyday life. The earliest mention of it comes from the 9th century, when a charter referred to the granting of land at Braunton to the Abbot of Glastonbury for the taking of salmon for his house. Rather than fishing, as you or I might think of it, our predecessors built fish weirs, or traps, out of wooden stakes which were driven into the mud to form a type of fence. In the 19th century, when shipping in the estuary was busier than ever, there were 18 fish weirs between Crow Point and the Port of Barnstable. They were a major hazard to navigation and disputes frequently broke out between the owners of the weirs and the crew of the boats. One tale tells of an ancient weir at Crow Point which was cut down by sailors from Appledore. Reports from the Admiralty suggest that the masters of vessels complained of loss of property and even loss of life owing to the fish weirs upstream towards Barnstable. If they caused such problems, why then did people continue to defend these structures, some of which were more than 350 metres long? A statement from John Corey Chichester says that he had six children and nothing to depend on but the weir. It suggests that poverty was the driving force. Indeed, a great many people would have relied on the weirs as an essential source of food and income. If it is low tide, there will be a large area of muddy salt marsh in front of you. This habitat is perfect for the many small snails, crabs and single-celled organisms that live here. These in turn provide food for large numbers of mallard, shelduck and a variety of wading birds. Glasswort is the first plant to colonise the bare sand in areas like this, where it quickly creates suitable conditions for sea blight to flourish. The tough, spiny-looking grass that you might see is called cord grass, and it was originally introduced last century to reclaim such areas around our coasts by trapping mud and holding it firm, which allows other plants to move in. Our tour is nearly finished now, to return to the car park, you'll need to continue around the curve of the beach and look for some boulders on your left in an opening in the dunes. Pass between them to find a track which will lead to the crossroads and the car park. Follow the track straight ahead, turn right and you will soon arrive at the car park. We really hope you've enjoyed your walk. On screen now are the names of some of the people and organisations who have made this tour possible.
there is much more to Braunton than we have been able to show you today. For more information, why not visit our website at www.explorebraunton.org or Braunton Museum or the Countryside Centre. Thanks for coming. Have a safe journey.